This is a production of Cornell University. Hi, everybody. My name is Pete Johnson. I have a farm called Pete's Greens in northern Vermont, um, zone three, zone four. We're way up there. Uh, started as a tiny little two acre, no, half acre farm 20 years ago now. Um, my experience with cover cropping up to about four years ago was sort of typical vegetable farm, you know, throwing some rye, throwing some buckwheat here and there. Um, and then I decided to go and find enough land to have three or four times as much land as we crop on. We crop about 100 acres and uh, we have about 400 acres in rotation now of varying quality. Some of it's not great. Um, but just jumped into this big experiment of trying to learn about technology. <laughs> so, um, just learning about cover crops. In my, in my talk, we'll just basically show the experiments that I've been involved with for three or four years now, um, different pieces of equipment, uh, different cover crops, things that I've learned, things that I realize I know almost nothing about and have a ton more to learn about. It's now way more fun for me than growing vegetables. It's super interesting. Um, the, the growing of the vegetables is sort of just a proof that you did a decent job with, with the prep time. We're also trying, we use a lot of raw chicken manure and other bulk soil amendments. And we're trying to get our soils fully up to speed, ready to roll in the cover cropping period before vegetables start. And that's still a couple of years away from really being there, but it's, I'm, I'm seeing lots of uh, good promise for that. We've taken a lot of land that was sort of real old played out land brought it back and in two or three years of lots of fertility, lots of cover cropping has really been successful. Is this, is this slide showing? It must be. Okay. Can you, uh, how do I get back to the beginning again? <laughs> so we're going to go at a certain pace apparently. <laughs> so I started off thinking I'm going to do, I'm going to do like two year sod. It's going to be my program. Legumes, grasses. And I did a bunch of that for the first couple of years. This is an example of that, thank you. Um, lots of uh, red clover, all site clover. Uh, the best grasses for us seem to be fescues, real aggressive growers. Um, but I'm not finding that after this, my soil has really transformed in the ways I want it to. It doesn't seem like it gained enough like bulk organic material. Um, some cases we've been haying this, some cases we've been mowing it back in. Um, in all cases, I haven't been super impressed by the results. So now I'm basically doing that with land that's really got some issues, needs to be locked away for a while. This is buckwheat. This is a mix that uh, we had this summer. Sunflowers, buckwheat. There were uh, some uh, peas in there, whole grab bag, oats. I'm planting more and more. This is perhaps the most important slide. This is 300 pounds an acre of oats. And Vern talked about tried and true stuff earlier. My hot weather, you know, Sudex, things like that, hardly grew for me this summer. It was so cold and wet where we are. Oats, day in, day out, I can get to crank 300 pounds an acre. No matter how weedy the field is, I basically get a clean stand every time. Um, and that's super important. That's probably the most important factor for me in what I choose to see. Feel free to ask questions at any point because this is a, just a grab bag. Um, so we're going to do more and more of you know, cheap seed, high, high rates, um, a whole bunch of organic matter production in a short period of time. This is uh, rye vetch that was knocked down. And that's what it looked like before we knocked it down. Um, we were doing some no-till stuff this spring for the first time. We had a no-till drill. Um, it was, has struggles doing it without having some weeds in there and made me kind of think it's not really going to be our future necessarily um, because just a little bit of established weed from the previous crop really becomes something serious in the, in the next crop. We played around with Caliente mustard this year, just aiming at weed, uh, killing weed seeds. Um, I'm not sure if it worked well. I'll show you the rig later that we used to incorporate it. Um, it was difficult without doing a really careful trial to tell. Um, I don't know what that is. That's my farm down there in the valley. Craftsbury. It's half an hour south of the Canadian border in the middle of the state. This is the mix of, uh, I was telling John Paul earlier, I, I tried sun hemp this summer. It got about eight inches tall. It's in here somewhere. 
Um, I was really excited, you know, it was going to be this huge, massive legume, and it just, in cool, wet conditions, it just didn't do anything. That's me pointing to a sun hemp plant down, down there. Um, so it's, it's really interesting how something that could be awesome one year, especially in a climate like mine, is not so great some other time. There's some pictures here to show how even in this great high seed rate mix like this, there is pigweed. There's a pigweed plant right in the middle there. And that's a serious problem. And that's, you know, in a rotation like I'm working on, I, I really can't have that. Um, I'll show some tools later that we're using to try to prevent that. It seems to me like with mixes, I have a lot to learn about the species composition, the rate, the timing, what time of year it is to make sure that doesn't happen. Here's um, a place that was no-till, knocked down rye vetch, seeded into it. It's trying to show that there's some weeds in there. We actually use buckwheat a lot in the summer. Like we'll, we'll seed uh, a sod crop, grass and legume, right through the summer. And we'll use buckwheat in the, in the midsummer period as a weed suppressant for that. It's much more effective than oats at that time of year. Um, buckwheat's at about 40 pounds an acre will basically keep weeds from going to seed in a newly seeded sod crop. More pigweed in this mix. It had sudex and all these things in it. And this was carefully prepared land that was tine weeded before seeding the cover crop. Sunflowers are a lot of fun. The first year I'd grown them this year, we had uh, lots and lots of tourists checking them out. I like the biomass I'm seeing off it. Um, the seed is cheap if you buy bird seed rather than, you know, sunflower seed seed. And germination seemed to be good. This is always the thing. Like you got this stand, you look down in there. You know, this was a super weedy vegetable land that had been kind of abused for two or three years. And you got those weeds down there, and you're like, okay, what are they going to do? Are they going to make seeds or not? And that's the critical question. And it really depends on how quickly things fill in and, and cover. In this case, probably yes, because there's gallons of in there, and it'll usually make seed wherever. But in the 300 pounds acre of oats, very, very little, maybe none. This was a fun thing we got this summer. We've been trying to do a mulching project for a number of years where we make round bales and then blow them onto vegetable plants yay tall. And we've, we've now played around with four different round bale choppers and none of them cut the round bales quite short enough. So my neighbor had this uh, forage chopper that we bought for 3,000 bucks and this was rye vetch, you know, yay tall, that we'd kind of forgotten about and had to grow vegetables on this field. And of course, there's nothing you can do with it at that point. It doesn't matter how many times you harrow it. So we mowed it with a uh, hay mower and then chopped it and blew it over the field. And I think we hit the stage just right. It was, you know, fully in grain, but still quite green. And the fertility production from this for the vegetable crop is really impressive. And I don't think it was from the vetch, because there wasn't that much vetch. It was the rye really released a lot of nutrients. And it was a fast step, didn't take very long. And that land was just ready to go and grew great crops. Start into equipment, we... Was that four chopper set up to, to feed the round bales into it? Or? No, that was chopping windrows. Um, but we've, what we've discovered now is that when we're doing our, our mulching, we have to forage chop and then spread that with a manure spreader. So we take dry round bales, or we take, we take dry windrows, forage chop them. It's basically a silage operation at this point, and we haven't quite figured out the details of that. But that spreads really well with a manure spreader right over very small vegetables, because it's only an inch long, and it falls off at all. Everything we were, all the round bale choppers are all two and a half inches plus, and it's just, it bridges over the crops. Um, these, this is a new, uh, we call it a speed disc, Farmet, it's a Czech company. Really slick tool. We have a lot of rocks in our area. Uh, we're constantly breaking gang bolts on disc harrows. 
This is the tool that's designed to be used at nine miles an hour. It's very fast. This is showing it incorporating two-year-old grass legume sod that, you know, historically we would mold board plow. Um, three passes with this thing at nine miles an hour at different angles in the right conditions if the soil is moist at the right level and you can seed a cover crop into this. Three to four passes over the course of three weeks and you can seed vegetables. Um, so this has become sort of a super critical tool for us. Um, we had a different version called a Lemkin. This is much cheaper, the parts are much cheaper. Um, the speed is tremendous when you have a lot of acres to cover. And each disc is individually, has an individual spring on it, so they just roll over rocks with no, no problem at all. Um, really long term, more established sod, it takes more passes than three to four. Um, but still with the speed, it's not a, not a big deal. We went and got a, a, a grain drill with six inch spacing this year because we had one that was seven and a half and it wasn't doing, wasn't planting stuff close enough. This was a nice addition. Although I think we're going to go to broadcasting. I wish I could back up. <laughs> Could you take me back to bidding and I could shuttle through again? Sorry. Um, that Farmet machine, just go to keep going. No, back to the equipment part, sorry. Right there. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, I can. If I was smarter, I could do that, couldn't I? Um, so, this seeder is not very useful. That's a seeder on there, drops the seed right here, right behind the disc, right before the rollers, but it's way too small. So we are looking at either pulling an air seeding cart behind this or having a much bigger air seeding tank on the front three point hitch of the tractor somehow to you know, be able to carry at least a ton of seed. And I like the idea of this because I'm not going to have rows at all. I'm going to have a uniform distribution of seed. We were demoing this and playing around with it um, just to see if we liked how it covered and it seemed like the main concern is it likes to cover the seed a little bit too deeply sometimes, but you could address the depth of these discs with these rollers here. Um, and it seems like it has a lot of potential and we can now be seeding at six, seven, eight, nine miles an hour rather than, you know, five with a grain drill, maybe six. Um, when you're covering several hundred acres and doing sometimes multiple crops on the same acres every year, speed becomes important. So these things come with a variety of rollers. This is a really heavy one that packs the soil more. <clears throat> Rain drill. This is our little cobbled together setup for incorporating the mustard. So we flail mode it and then just seconds behind, we disc harrowed and culti packed. It seemed to work fairly well. This is a 30-foot uh, Lely tine weeder, and we tine weed a lot in our vegetable production. We almost don't plant anything without um, a week and a half to two weeks of every three to four days tine weeding as a stale seed bed practice. So I thought, boy, I'll do this on large scale for cover crops and it'll work great. And it didn't work that well, and I can't, I'm not really quite sure why. Um, this spring I time weeded a field for three weeks prior to seeding cover crops. I think it was just too cold and wet and nothing was growing at all at that point. Because when I seeded my cover crop, I still had a whole lot of weeds come in. Um, so it's probably just a timing thing, but uh, I'd almost rather just use a much higher rate with, with some cheaper crops and, and deal with it that way because you have to get out and about with this thing. But, um, I think it's a tool that has a lot of potential for cleaning up some ground before seeding a cover crop to try to keep weeds from coming in. Um, but we haven't really found a sweet spot with it yet. This is this no-till grain drill we had, actually a minimal till. This is the caddy that went in front of a regular grain drill and these coulters made slices. Um, if anybody's interested, I'm also learning how to do my own tiling. That's a tile plot of the left. Whole nother saga. <laughs> this is the grain drill that went behind that coulter cart. This was just kind of a big cumbersome thing. Hard to turn around, you know, slow to pick up. He needed quite a bit of horsepower to pull it. Um, 
decided it's not maybe the final solution. <laughs> keep going. Okay. Hopefully we'll blow up here at some point. <laughs> Just keep going. I'm stuck. Oh, you're stuck. Okay. They won't let me move. We're about to restart. Yeah, what I found, and I haven't done it enough to really be sure, but it seems like those large seeded things, if you let them go to seed and let them sit on top of the soil for the winter, I have not had problems. When I incorporate them, I sometimes do. But that's kind of cool to learn that you can, you know, dump all this stuff on top of the soil and let, let everything eat it all winter. Um, but I have friends who had a lot of problems with buckwheat doing that, so I don't, I don't know, but it hasn't been an issue for us. Um, it's nice because I like to grow, I like to have buckwheat as a component of some of those mixes and of course it's going to seed. Um, so This is the Umbaferth rolling harrow. This is a really cool tool. Uh, it's just these bat. Well, we have these, these little scraper bl leveling blades or leveling levelers that sit in front of those baskets, and then little tines. They're off it right now, and then two sets of rolling baskets. This thing's 30 feet wide, and so we were worried about making really smooth hay fields for a while because we were. That sort of was our plan early on. We're going to be haying and making all this mulch and stuff, and this is a really important tool for making. One pass of this makes land. You know, fairly rough land, pretty darn smooth. It's also great if you're broadcasting cover crops to incorporate. Um, you can also stale seed bed with this. It works really well, um, rather than the tine weeder. Every pass with it just makes things smoother and nicer and better. This is 5,000 bucks out of Quebec, in good shape. Um, really awesome tool. Cover a lot of acres in a short amount of time. This is another speed disc. This is the Lemkin Reuben. This is the one we got first. Uh, we went away from it because the parts are really expensive and you're going to go through discs and bearings and it just seemed kind of crazy how much they cost. Uh, we got a power harrow a couple years ago. It, uh, we actually have broken a lot of sod with this too in places that are too steep to plow. Um, doesn't do great in rocks, really great for finished touch over vegetable crops. Just another piece of the component. In France, they seed a lot of grain behind power harrows. Uh, seems to be the standard practice over there. There's a, there's a you know, grain drill mounted behind the power harrow. How easy is it to control Really easy. You just two pins on a roller. So you can go really fast and really shallow. You can go eight miles an hour and just be skimming along, or you can really, really go. It's a very versatile tool. It's just, uh, it's, much, it's a better tool if you don't have a lot of rocks. So we tend to use it in certain fields, not in other ones. Uh, speaking of rocks, rock rake. Um, we, got, we took on 70 acres a couple springs ago that was at corn ground. I mean, I think it has a rock resource. There, the, the number of cobbles like this is just infinite. And we were able to seed really nice alfalfa grass down by making one pass with this thing. And then we had another machine to pick up the rocks. Um, and this also leaves a perfectly smooth finish for, for seeding. Versatile tool. Uh, the, bale, the round bale mulching, because I kind of think of mulching as kind of an extension of cover cropping. You think about no-till, you think about all the different things you can do. Mulching is sort of like moving moving cover crop from one place to another. This is a real simple old time bale chopper. It's more of a flail. The flail is just kind of beat around. It, does, it doesn't uh, actually cut the grass at all, but it throws it out. It's really good for garlic and uh, strawberries, things where you're just kind of doing bulk mulching. It's really fast. Um, simple tool, not a lot to go wrong. This is the best one we found for actually cutting quite short. This is, uh, has a two different chopping systems in there. It takes a lot of horsepower. It's pretty slow. It's maybe a bale every five minutes, four to five minutes. You don't want to have any rocks or anything like that in your bale. It's got to be nice and clean. Um, different purpose. This is what we were trying to use to blow onto the vegetable crops. And it actually works well. This does chop it fine enough that it works pretty well. Um, it's just a pretty slow step. and. 
I'm not sure if we're going to be incorporating it into a lot of our acreage or not. <laughs> Thanks. This is, I'm just learning about these. This is an air seeding cart. An idea is to pull this. I have a 20 foot wide one of those farmants coming. And idea being we could pull this behind that and be seeding into the farmant with it. It's kind of a big cumbersome thing, but I could go out with four tons of seed and something like this and, you know, not have to come back and refill. This would be like for bulk, like 300 pounds an acre oats, stuff like that. Um, so if anybody has any experience with, with this or an air seeder like this, I found this, this is in England, but it's a big, you know, a big tank where the seed goes and then those are just shanks where the seed comes out, they're five inches apart, so it's really close spacing. That's a 24 foot wide machine. Um, but I got to get away from the 12 foot wide grain drill, which is, is taking too long for the amount of land we're covering. And this just arrived today. This is, this is what we're going to pull the 20 foot new speed disc with um, because I want to spend more time with my daughter and less time on the tractor. And uh, these things are cheap. I mean, the horsepower like this is super cheap. And uh, we're, we're, we're moving towards speed, you know, quick passes, shallow passes, fast passes, you know, incorporate it, get something else on. Um, so sort of like our version of no-till is lots of quick shallow passes, um, not bringing up lots of weed seeds from below, um, lots of different cover crops and different sequences, um, and as you can tell, very much a, a learning process. That's it for slides. Questions, comments? Yeah. <clears throat> Top secret. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, so when you say cheap, what? Twelve grand. What's the Three sixty. It's crazy. I mean, the biggest tractor I have is 140 horsepower. It's also 13 feet wide, which is going to be interesting on the roads. But, <laughs> but we pull implements down the road that are 15 feet wide, but there's something about the height that scares people. Right out front. <laughs> My neighbor is restoring a Porsche, and I told him this is going to come into his shop. We're going to paint this first. He's all excited. But this, I guess, this sort of sums up like how we do things. We kind of go online, learn about it, figure out how to buy a version of it that we can afford, bring it home, try it. Sometimes they work out, sometimes they don't. But you don't know until you get it home, and you always learn something interesting, and it just informs the next step of the process. Yeah. So when you said you're going for cheap, what's your target price for your cover Oh, of course that varies a lot from, you know, if you're seeding down a nice alfalfa grass mix, it's going to be 45, 50 to 70 bucks for the seed. Sometimes I'm going organic here, sometimes I'm not, depending on whether I can get it. Um, you know, it's the 300 pounds of oats I can get done organically for 55 to 60, something like that. Um, the sun hemp was an expensive failure, <laughs> you know. Um, and that's a question I often ask myself, you know, is, is three crops in a season, you know, if I have a piece of ground where I'm really trying to break up a weed seed cycle and I might want to actually have three cover crops in the course of a season to have a little tillage in between, am I going to spend 100 bucks per seeding there, it's probably totally worth it, but I don't really know that math. I don't really know what makes sense. I have vegetable crops that gross $45,000 an acre, so sure, why not? But it adds up, you know, it starts to seem like a lot of money. Um, my sense is the more you spend, it's totally worth it. You just, I, for us, it's a new part of our budget we're kind of getting used to. Um, so it seems like our seed costs just keep going up and up, but I think the benefits are really there. What's your like typical rotation? You're in vegetables in the field for a couple of years, and then well, what the the grand plan was two years veggies and two years in a sod crop. But I'm finding that in my second year in veggies, I'm not getting the performance I want. 
So I'm looking now mostly at one year of veggies and land that's in really good shape, probably one year of veggies, one year of cover crop. Sometimes the one year of cover crop is more like a year and a half. You know how the, all this stuff kind of goes around in circles. Um, but I actually have enough land here. I could basically be one year in veggies, two years off, three years off in some cases. I mean, I have some, I have some land that still is recovering from being overcropped for a while. So it'll be off for three years. Um, but I'm finding that in that second year, no matter how good a job we did the first year in weed control, I start having some weeds going to seed in the second year. And we don't, we don't spend hardly any time hand weeding on my farm. Um, very, very, very small part of our budget. So it's either controlled with tractor cultivation and pre-treatment pre or it's not really controlled. So um, I, like, I like land that's just first year in veggies after not being in it for a couple of years. It really, it solves a ton of problems. And it makes all this stuff seem cheap in comparison. You know, it's such a unique situation compared to a lot of roads where you have so much extra land. Yeah. So but that was, but, but that was created though by deciding to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. And I know it can't happen everywhere, maybe, but I think. But just my question is what would you advise people that don't have that well, you know, sneak them in wherever you can, but I, I would advise trying to, I, I see great benefits too from a rotation that goes a mile or two or three miles away. You know, potato beetles for us are a real problem and if we can move our 10 acres of potatoes a couple, three miles away, um, it's really a lot better. So we've gotten really comfortable. We, we travel 20 acres right now, or 20 miles right now to one farm. Um, We've gotten comfortable with the travel and the trade-off of that compared to having everything close. Um, we, we, well, we won't be cropping down there for a couple of years, but yeah. I mean, it goes 23 miles an hour, why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. We, uh, we don't irrigate is another thing. So for us to move around, we haven't irrigated outdoors in seven years. Partly that's our climate. Partly it's a lot of organic matter residue in the soil. So we're not so tied into an infrastructure. We can go and get a new field and, and farm over here. Um, so it's sort of like, we're sort of like creating these landscapes around that are in prime condition for vegetables. And then we sort of dash in and grow a crop and get out of there again. That's how I think about it. And that is leading to a fairly low input, fairly low cost production system that seems to be working for us. But it's still another three years before everything kind of is fully online to make it all work the right way. Sir, can you sell any off those acres? I thought I was gonna at first, but then the, the turns out the fertility suck up of hay is enormous. So even, even just to replace the nutrients it's taking is about two thirds of the value of the hay. And then there's nothing to screw up trying to grow vegetables than having a major haying week going on. Because it's the same guys, the same equipment. When you're haying, you're haying. I mean, you're not doing anything else. And we actually love haying, it's super fun. We get all excited about it. But, uh, so now we're mostly flail mowing stuff back down. We, make, we have a, a pig farm as well, so we make a whole bunch of round bales for it, but they come back onto the land. And I think if you were doing like a small round or small square bale, premium organic hay thing, you could make money doing it, but you'd have to be set up for it. And it's just not, it's too, too wet where we are too. That it's hard to dry it. Um, so we actually had to buy, we have a mower with metal on metal rollers in order to crimp the legumes well enough to get legumes dry at all. Um, for our mulching hay and for our pig hay, because we're trying not to wrap bales. Um, that was a critical piece of equipment. We, we couldn't get red clover to dry, period, otherwise. <laughs> so that's helped a, a ton with that. <clears throat> we're doing great right now, so. Yeah. What's that? I'm so sorry. That's fine. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.